and we're going to click the blue go live button. Here it goes. Click. And we're live. It is Wednesday, May 19th, 2021, 5.01 p.m. And uh, uh, Scott has a story to tell you all. What? Wait, what? I was just seeing how you would react to that. Uh, Scott okay, actually okay, doesn't it's more, have it's a story. Just more, it's just more hazing, Scott. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Because the thing is... Wait, before... when is Pledge Week over for you, Scott? How long does this last? <laughs> I, 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 I think the next election. But Jordan, I, I just want you to know that before you were going to come on, we were going to spend the, this hour talking about my recital. That's right. Um, Your recital. It was amazing. It was so great. No, I, pl I yeah, pledged it, to not share the video. Otherwise, I would share it all with you. <laughs> so, so Scott did really, good. I, he did good. Yeah. Uh, it's a nice yeah. performance. But, 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 but I, you guys are all spared. Um, but what did you recite, that. Scott? Uh, it was a guitar recital. But I was uh, very, uh, I was very, very nervous for about it i took it very seriously and uh the mean age of the performers was like eight um <laughs> like everyone was like super young and does, then does me. that mean include you so it was like a yeah, bunch of no, I, that's, what I said, <laughs> that's what i said that's what i said you're, you're bringing the, up the, 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 the everybody it. out there how many five-year-olds would it take that's your homework <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, yeah. to bring together with scott to I, bring the mean age down to i eight. would just say that when one of the five-year-olds really screwed up bad. So I was really? like, because the so thing is, like, I, I, didn't, I beat him. Yeah, <laughs> you, just, I really, you just go up to that kid and go like, sucks to be you. Yeah, well, no, I'm so I, glad no, I'm we not you right now. It. Oh my God. We all thought it. I mean, come on. <laughs> we are not allowed to have fun anymore. And that five-year-old is really not allowed to have fun anymore. Hopefully but you didn't are, watch a Lua Fun show. I clicked but the button we are this allowed to have shape by Jordan Ellenberg. You have a copy um, already. I do. I actually have two copies. I have a galley's copy and I have the actual hardback. Damn. Um, but Jordan, I, I sort of want to start with the question of how you went from being a math professor at a major university to writing about women's fitness. Well, you know, I mean, fitness. Shape Magazine is a big deal. It's a big deal, and it was not easy to, uh, you know, to sort of develop this partnership with them. But you know, they could see that I take fitness very seriously. I mean, look at me. Um, <laughs> Why? <laughs> this is the type of joke that you're only allowed to make after someone completes a book that they've worked for years on. Uh, and, that, like, and happens that, to give it the same that, name. That you like went to preschool with. This is like a complete. Like, <laughs> this is like a complete privilege that you have. Um, I, I'm actually very. I am very interested in um, in what you think of the New York Times review and what you think of kind of people's reactions to the book so far, and if it's meeting the expectations of what you set out to do with the book. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I'll start with just you know I've been talking to lots of people, um, doing lots of podcasts that are mo that are mostly going to come out you know after the book comes out next Tuesday. Um, because podcasting is sort of in this kind of still somewhat distance world, sort of like what book publicity mostly looks like. And, you know, you, what you worry in advance is that you're going to find yourself like always saying the same thing and getting stale. But in fact, um, you know, the nature of the subject, the nature of the subject of geometry is such that everybody has a different response to it. So I probably talked to like, I don't know, like five or six or eight different people. And every conversation has been totally different because different parts of the book resonate with different people and they have like really fundamentally different questions. So that's been, that makes it a lot more fun. Now, as okay. for the review that ran today, which is such a wonderful review by Purul Segal in the New York Times, you know, what I liked about it is that she came to the book from the perspective of somebody who might not be inclined to pick up a book about geometry, like from the bookshelf. You know, the, the, the people who, know they want to read a book about geometry may already you know hopefully they know about it already um but who i want to know about is the is the people who really don't think that's something who could that could possibly interest them or in the words of parole use could possibly entertain them uh and i hope it will 
So give us an overview of the book. The <laughs> subtitle, I'm going to mute you, Scott. Um, well, it's organized by muscle groups, obviously, you know, sort of starting <laughs> from the shoulders and... Yeah. Stop. Okay. Do not play into this bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bit's over? Okay, I'm sorry. Like, oh, no, 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 there's no over. way. You're better than that, Jordan. The bit will keep coming back all... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Jordan is so not better than that. Um, <laughs> the subtitle is The Hidden Geometry of Information, Biology, Strategy, Democracy, and Everything Else. Uh, what is the unifying idea that puts all of this under the auspices of the word shape and, and under, uh, uh, under the idea of geometry, which most people think of as that sort of ninth or tenth grade, yeah, so, um, I mean, I uh, really you know, hard. learning about proofs and bisecting angles. Uh, uh, right, and I'm, I, I'm not going to say that no angles were bisected in the production of this book. I can think of at least one. <laughs> um, and that is like that's sort of where it all starts. So in some sense, that's the beginning, right? Euclid is like where we first think of geometry as a really formal subject, but you know. That term nowadays is used much more broadly than that. And you know what I'd say uh, as a first uh, a sentence is that the moment that you talk about things being close together or far apart, you know, this word geometry, it means measuring the earth. That's the Greek cognate to it. Um, the moment that you say more than just are two things the same or are they different and say like, well, wait, there's degrees. Things could be very similar, close together or people or things could be far apart. At that moment, you're doing something geometric. And it's something we do all the time when we talk about a close relative. We're geometrizing with the notion of a family. That's actually one of the geometries I talk about in the book. Um, and so that idea is incredibly powerful. The idea of what do we mean by distance? What do we mean by close or far away? Um, that leads you to what do you mean by sort of like a space that you can explore and that just touches everything. How, how, how many places um, of pi, in the decimal expansion of pi, do you recommend that we all know? Um, I recommend that you know that it starts with three I actually don't have a brief for any more digits than that. And actually, you know, this is a this is actually a point I hit in the book that it really doesn't matter what the digits of pi are. That is not important. What See, matters I, is I, there's... I, I, I think that is important um, because, like, if you don't, you won't get the circumference right. Well, let me say what is important, and then you'll see if you disagree. What's important is that there's such a thing as pi. In other words, that what that ratio is between the radius of a circle and its circumference. Yeah. Somehow we knew I was going to see circumference at least one point in this discussion. So the, the, that ratio is the same no matter what the circle is. That's a deep conceptual fact about circles, that there's in some sense only one kind of circle. There's only one shape a circle can have. And that's the important fact. What that ratio is, you know, if instead of a circle you talked about a square, you'd get a different value of pi. Okay, I forgot what it is in my head. It's like two root two or something I've forgotten, but it's, you know, the ratio of the distance from the center to the corner as against the perimeter, that's the same for all squares. And that's a fact about squares that there's sort of only one shape of them. That's the, that's what's of conceptual importance. So, so Scott, this is like, this is like, he's like your people, because remember when we were with, with Julian and Nick yesterday and we we're like, you're lawyers that know 18 USC is something, 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 something. And we're lawyers that are just like, oh yeah, the law. This is what you're saying. <laughs> I have to say, guys, I guys, I was screaming at the screen when you guys said that. Because you were like, I, I, I don't like laws. I, I like the law. And I was screaming at the screen, I hate the law. I, I like a lot of laws. <laughs> And I, well, I, this I, is a, that's the boring this shit. Is, you know, yeah, I, this is what this is why I'm this is what makes, this is what makes this magic, the okay. fact that you know we are. But I would just say, tell me that not all of you like memorized pi to the to to like, yeah, to like a like, you know, fifteen ex decimal expansion places. I, I mean, know fifteen. I'm sure I know ten. There was okay, this belief you... in my in my pre -cal class that like or my calculus class that like memorized it just for show, like out to like the hundred and fiftieth digit, and he yeah. would like do it on command. Uh, I think uh, on your desk there, Kate. 
Yeah, no, I just like, well, he was a jerk for a bunch of reasons, but like <laughs> one of them was that he had you, wasted you didn't brain need another space. reason. <laughs> I know, like, I was just, <laughs> I was like, I, know, wrote, like, I wrote this program into T I my TA89, I'll beat you. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I think okay. this tension that you guys talk about between these two approaches to law is very visible in mathematics and especially geometry, because both are in the end important, right? It is actually important to know what the ratio of the circumference to the radius of a circle is, but it's also sort of important to sort of step back and say there's sort of some class of figures that have that yeah, property see, I, there's a unique ratio see, there, yeah, and both there. of those things are sort of are part of the subject and they dance together so scott actually does it at a different level of abstraction because he doesn't even care about the law he cares about what is law I as, just a, care, right, as a concept so he would, <laughs> he would be like sort of the philosophy of what is math and he'd teach yeah, all that's what like, he that's, does. Uh, that, um, no, that is, Jordan. That's a big thing. Okay, okay so here's. Full of math. I want to focus on Jordan's book for a minute here. Um, you so, <laughs> uh, I want to go through the subtitle. Um, you talk about the hidden geometry of information, biology, strategy, democracy, and everything else. So let's talk about those in order. Uh, what is the hidden geometry of information? Oh, so now I have to remember like what I mean by each one of those things. Okay, yeah, you, it made sense got, to me at the time. Okay. You, yeah, and I'm sure this um, proceeded following a extended negotiation with your editors about about what was going to be in the title. So now I we're did gonna... change it at the last minute. What what did I take out and what did I put in? There was something that we changed after they'd already sort of sent the image to. Amazon and I made sort of a pain of myself being like, no, no, I decided like, I think I took money out. I think money used to be in there. And I felt no. like there wasn't enough about money, although there is some, but I was like, but there's not enough for it to be like subtitle worthy. So what's the hidden geometry of information? Um, so there, I would say, I talk a lot in the book about the fact that geometry applies to things that are not like points on a plane or points in space, the way we normally think about, think about it, things like words, which is a wonderful example. So like there's lots of progress. All the progress we see, you see on like automatic translation or on autocomplete, right? When you're typing in your Gmail and it sort of leaps ahead of you and sort of like says the next word that you're gonna say. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when that happens to me, I, I type something else. I won't let Google win. <laughs> I will not complete it the way it told me to complete it because I'm my own man. Um, or if I really must, I type it myself. I don't. Like yeah, I, I have to say I, I, I am with you. Google now uh, Gmail suggests responses to my emails. And even when that is what I would say, I kind of make a point of saying exactly it in my own words. I, exactly. I, I, just, I feel I feel owned when Google like suggests how I should. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> you know, she's going to she, she proposes bringing somebody on the show. And I'm going to be like, yeah, sure. And I hit reply. And then Google writes, yeah, sure. And I'm like, that would be great. <laughs> but do you actually change your answer or just the way are you like, no, I'm going to say no now because Google thought I wanted to say yeah, sure. No, 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 no. Because I, I, I don't think the uh, but I think Kate is entitled to my words, not Google's words. Scott can get Google's words, but Kate, <laughs> <laughs> Kate deserves my words. And, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, we've been working together on the show for a long time. I don't think the audience should be punished by getting the wrong answer just because Google anticipated the way. But I'm totally with you about this. What does this have to do with well, geometry? Well, yeah. I'm going to tell you. So what's in it? <laughs> so, so. So what does this have to do with my book? I talk about this fact that, and this oversimplifies a bit what's actually going on inside the guts of Gmail, but um, you can model a word as a as a vector in a very high dimensional space. And so of course this gives me the chance to talk about like vectors and what they are and high dimensional spaces and how we think of them. But what it amounts to is the idea that in order to make anything like this work, you have to have some idea of a geometry of words, some idea that if you want to sort of guess what word comes next you look at all the words you've seen and say like what neighborhood do these live in like kind of what's nearby these other words like what might be a natural thing to fill in or even a sort of geometry of sentences which sentences are close to each other um and a kind of wonderful i, I write about this uh google project called word to vec um where they find that using these geometric ideas of adding vectors together which is sort of something we do uh in 10th grade uh you can make something which in some cases sort of does analogies for you 
there's a certain mathematical operation you can do to a vector which changes he to she and then you can apply it to other words and you actually see that it sort of often sort of picks out what you call you know you apply it to king and you get queen you do this purely mathematical thing that is sort of somehow picking out uh an operation you might call feminization now of course what is it really doing it's not actually doing something with the meaning of the words because it doesn't know it's doing something about looking at all the huge corpus of english text that it has um and understanding what happens when people write in a context where they're typing he and what happens in a context where people are typing she. So you're not seeing the meaning of the word. You're sort of psychoanalyzing people's gender habits and like what words they use about men and what words but they use about women. why is that geometry? Oh. Because the actual thing you are doing is saying a word is uh, a point in space with coordinates. Now, the, the, the thing is that a point in a plane, it has two coordinates, right? An X and a Y, or if you're on the surface of the Earth, a longitude and a latitude. Well, a point in a 300-dimensional space has 300 coordinates. And, you know, one of the insights of modern geometry is that that seems like very intimidating and hard to visualize. But actually, the geometric operations basically work in the same way. Like, you sort of develop your intuition in two and three dimensions, and then you realize that all of these constructions that you build, these ideas about... You know, what does a parallelogram mean, which is what actually is relevant for this particular thing we're talking about with the analogies. Um, you can't visualize a par parallelogram in 300 dimensional space. But if you understand sort of formally how it works in two dimensional space and then kind of just say, I'm going to do the same thing in 300 dimensional space, um, it just works. You know, there's this sort of thing of Hinton, uh, who is one of the developers of neural nets, which is something else I write about in the book a lot. Um, when, you know, they asked him, like, well, how do you really visualize this 14 dimensional space? you need to work in in order to get this machine you built to work. And he says like, well, you know, you visualize a three dimensional space and then you very loudly say 14. <laughs> <laughs> and that is in fact what we all do, what all higher geometers do. Like, I mean, we don't, our physical intuition doesn't really operate past can, the third dimension. Can, can I ask a question too? So if, if like what, what Descartes discovered, right, was that you could correlate geometry with analysis with, with, with an equation, you know, with various functions, algebraic functions. So in some sense, anything that can be anything that can be represented as a function is in some sense geometric, no? Yeah, absolutely. So what Scott's talking about is that this notion of like, the coordinate plane where you're like, what's my X coordinate and what's my Y coordinate? It was really Descartes. I mean, this comes rather late in the history. Lots of geometry is under the bridge, like before, you know, Rene comes along and, and coordinatizes the plane. And you're absolutely right that in that moment, anything geometric, um, you can also think of as algebraic. And anything algebraic, you can also think of as geometric. And, you know, since I'm an algebraic geometer, that's my actual job as a mathematician. Um, um, my whole life is spent uh, at this borderline, kind of doing geometry where it's useful to do geometry and doing algebra where it's useful to, to do algebra. Um, and these things intertwine. So you're absolutely right. A person of a more algebraic bent might say, oh, like Google identifies with each word with a length of a list of 300 numbers. And, you know, if you when you type it into the computer, like if you're actually playing with this thing on your computer, which you can, it's pretty fun. I download it and play with it a lot. Yeah, that's what it will show you. You'll see a list of 300 numbers. But I think for most of us, you know, geometry is very intuitive. Like you could write down the algebraic equation for a parallelogram, but honestly, to understand what's going on, for most people, it's so much more primal to kind of think of a parallelogram. We sort of know what that looks like and we know what properties it has just directly from our intuition. And then you just shout loudly 14 dimensions. <laughs> I do. I do. I do it a lot. So what is the hidden geometry of biology? I'm just going to well, go through, the, sub hold on. Go hold through on. the subtitle. Can we really? Well, I wanted to ask, and I kind of think it's related to what Scott just asked and what Jordan was just talking about, which is like if every, if like algebra, <clears throat> excuse me, algebra can be geometry, which it can, or whatever. Is there a... Do you make a leap to Coase at all in like in any of this, like to Ronald Coase or to like kind of like I feel I mean, I mean, this is my intuition is that like there is a part of like Coase and Coase theorem, which is just like this 
movement, about friction and distance, and that would imply a lot of what you're talking about, but like maybe I'm very much being reductionist and kind of like lumping way too much when I should be splitting, but like I, I would be interested if you would do any of that work in this book. So I don't do that in this book and the kind of application of advanced mathematics to economics. Actually, I, I taught an undergraduate course last term, which a lot of economics grad students have to take. And one of my failures in this course was I never successfully really understood like why economists like need to learn this part of math. But it's definitely true that um, all these kinds of existence theorems in economics where they're like there is an equilibrium which like, has a certain kind of property. If you dig into what they're actually doing, um, it's always sort of some very abstract space, what we would call in math a topological space. And they're saying like, okay, this, so this sort of speaks to the space of strategies, Ben, which is one of the things in the subtitles. If you think of like um, strategies in a game, then a lot of these theorems of econ economics are saying like in this kind of like vast high dimensional space of like maybe infinite dimensional space of all possible strategies you could have to claim that there's one strategy that is one point in this space, uh, that has some special property of being an equilibrium of some kind. Um, that's always a geometric argument. But I don't do that in this book. No, it, it actually strikes me as Cosa's core, Ronald Cosa's, just to be sure that we're not talking like sine, cosine, like just like clearing that <laughs> up. <laughs> For a moment, I thought you were. <laughs> I realized that after I started saying it, but I was, uh, but I was going to say that like, I, like so, one of the main the like theoretical qualms with Coase, as I've always understood it, is that like the entire position that he stands in, which is the idea that all things being equal, if we bargain from this position of equality, and of course you do never have that balance, you never have that ability to like be in a world in which that would exist. And this almost seems like now that you're mentioning it through geometry, this almost seems like mathematically very provable. Um, although I've never heard it mentioned in geometric terms, which is like kind of just why I was thinking about it. I, yeah, and actually this, this question you raise that there's this tension between what you can prove in an abstract way under some simplifying assumptions proved purely mathematically and what actually happens. Um, that's actually a good lead into the question that Ben asked about like what is what is the math, what is the geometry of biology like what's happening there in this book. So I would say you know about a little more than a year ago I suddenly became like much more interested in mathematical epidemiology than I had been previously and like so Can't did a lot of people. Why? Just happened. One of those things, you know, who knows where your passions will take you. Um, <laughs> Jordan is the son, by the way, of not one, but two mathematical biostatisticians. It's just one saying. of whom my mom, if you go back, wrote, in my opinion, and she is my mom, but the, the sort of early mathy editorial about COVID that I think has held up the best out of all almost all of the March 2020 editorials by the and she had your, should also, we what's should her also name, Jordan? Say, we should also say Susan about Susan Ellenberg, Ellenberg uh, that she was for many years the chief statistician uh, at uh, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease under one Anthony Fauci. Have you had her on? You should have her on to no, do a vaccine show. Have, that would be amazing. Have, oh my God, yeah, we should have, we should have her on. on. Um, okay, that's settled. Yeah, um, let's do that. Perfect. I'm finding, is this, wait, is this the one she wrote in April about post-COVID lives? Maybe, it's with two other people. I give my mom okay. all the credit, of course. I, okay, I'll find it, I'll find it. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Um, so, so there, so wait, so there's this, there's this question of, which is on people's minds of, What's going to happen? Right? Like, what what can we figure out about this kind of unknown crisis that we're about to embark on? Um, and people made models, right? Flatten the curve. Okay, what's the curve? Like, what curve are we talking about here? This is where we were uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and just as Kate says, there's this tension between what you can do abstractly, mathematically, under some assumptions about the conditions. Um, and what's reality? And that's a tension we've all been living through, right? That we've all been experiencing. Um, a bit humbling, right? If you sort of have a mathematical approach. And, you know, the way I describe it in the book is, is it's a bit like, you know, if you're trying to model a tennis match, um, you can't mathematically model who's going to win a tennis match. On the other hand, 
you can mathematically model. It's very easy. What happens if you throw a tennis ball up in the air and don't hit it? And you can even model if you hit the tennis ball in a certain way with a certain amount of spin. That's harder, but you can sort of have some idea of what's going to happen. It may not be perfectly accurate, but the physics is definitely useful in understanding how that works, and it's useful for the players too. But of course, when there's an interplay between the physics and how people respond to the physics, then you're outside the realm of what can be fully mathematically modeled. And I think that's sort of like what we see. I think the mathematical models don't predict the future as we have seen again and again, but that doesn't mean they're useless because that's not what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to be sort of more like the physics of tennis, like what might happen if we do this? What are the range of outcomes? Is it likely to push us this way or that way? That's the kind of thing the models are really good for and have continued to be good for. To be fair though, those are incredibly complex, like, Incre like there is, there's just so, so like there's infinite factors of of unknowns in a um, tennis match versus hitting a tennis ball. Like there are, I mean, right? Like I, I mean, like that. I mean, that makes sense to me. Like that just seems very obvious. Like of course you can't model. I mean, well, not yet. We can't model a tennis game. Um, but, but don't you think a pandemic is just as complicated? There's a lot more people in a pandemic than there are in a tennis match. Yes. No. That's true. On the other hand, on the other hand, there's some point at which the addition of people makes modeling easier, right? Yeah. Right. Because I guess that's kind of what I was thinking. When you're modeling Kate v. Uh, Scott Shapiro, you've got two highly individualistic. There's no wisdom of crowds. There's just. But when you're modeling, you know, the behavior of two billion people, you can round all individualism to zero. And you can you can start treating people. Yeah, and like then you're doing what Coast did, right? Then you're doing right. what no, Coast no, did. Then you're saying all things being equal, and that kind of works, and it kind of doesn't. And that's I think. So, you know, in the in the book, I talk about how these models were developed, which is a, a super interesting. In fact, one thing I learned that I didn't know is that people were making models like this. There's a guy called William Farr before there was even the germ theory of the disease. I mean, this is amazing to me that like people are sort of looking at the data and saying like, let's try to interpolate and let's try to understand what kind of curve is being followed. You know, normally you think, oh, you understand something about the science and then you build a model based on how you know diseases work to see what's gonna happen. But no, it goes the other way around. I mean, he's doing this kind of modeling. And then in the footnote, he's like, he's writing about smallpox. And, he's, and this is, I think around 1850 in the footnote, he's like, you know, some people think there's these like tiny little animals that like jump from one person to another that are giving them the disease. now. That seems weird to me and like nobody's ever seen one of these things but you know it doesn't really matter like we know it's contagious somehow so I mean, and you know the modeling is in some sense you can do a lot of it without understanding what's going on and certainly that was the position we were in with COVID at the beginning where of course we, the germ theory of the disease at least we have but like the mechanisms of, of transmission were not very well understood at the beginning i thought it was all <laughs> little men <laughs> can i ask can, can i ask you a question because you're uh you're 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 obviously extremely accomplished mathematician. You work on algebraic geometry at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So you're so you're 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 you're. I'm I'm assuming I, I don't have the competence to judge, but I'm assuming you're a top mathematician. Did you learn anything new about the math about math from doing from writing the book? Oh my God! Yes, almost all of it. Because I, here's the really? thing I got to tell you, and and I think has everybody in this room write 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 books, so you know what I'm talking about. You know, I I made an outline, like I guess now it's like almost two years ago, and was like this is what I'm going to write about. And of course, when you write an outline, you write about lots of stuff that you know about because you're sort of making a case, right? Here's some stuff I know about that I'm going to write about, and then you sit down to write, and you and you sort of start researching and going into more depth, and you sort of find connections, and you go to other places, and you just like find all these incredible stories that take you places. And then the stuff you don't know is like so much more interesting to write about than the stuff that you do know, because you're learning and learning is exciting and you can't really write unless you're excited. So you so really I'm, learn things about geometry though? Because you learn things about geometry that you didn't know before you wrote the book? Of course. Wow, that's, Look, that's we're all very awesome. ignorant. We're all very ignorant beings. Well, I love that. Let it speak for yourself. 
But, um, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, uh, one I mean, particular th- one particular thing, Scott, is that, and I don't know if you consider this about geometry or not, but I do because geometry, is, like all mathematics, is a human activity. Math is made of people, um, and so you know when when you're trained in as you get your PhD in math and you're trained in research, it's an extremely a historical training. We're taught nothing about like where right. these ideas come from. We're taught about you know where they are now, and so on the other hand, as a teacher. I mean, one thing I've learned is that as a teacher, in order to be a good teacher, you have to be able to put yourself in the mind of somebody who doesn't already understand the thing that you understand. Otherwise, how can you teach, right? Unless you can sort of imagine your way into that state of mind. Well, an awesome way to do that is to think historically and go back to the people who are creating the ideas. Even if you sort of know how the idea looks now, the best way to put yourself into the mind of somebody who hadn't yet formalized or articulated it in the way we do now is to go and see what those people said who didn't understand it because they were in the past. And that's incredibly enriching for a mathematician to like go back and look and be like, how did people think about these ideas when they were being creative? Like, could they have gone a different way? Like, what were the wrong turns people took? I mean, we don't know any of that, professional mathematicians. Now I know a little bit of it, like what's in this book. All right, before we go to audience questions, I want to ask you about a subject in the book that I, um, I know you have thought a lot about um, I haven't read the book yet, but I do, I have a strong instinct as to... And you have two is. copies, you have no excuse. And I do, but I, but I, <laughs> I the, no, the pub date wasn't until next week, um, which is the, uh, the ge- hidden geometry of democracy. You live in Wisconsin, you have spent a lot of time thinking about gerrymandering in Wisconsin. I assume when you talk about the hidden geometry of democracy, uh, the the shape of congressional districts in your home state is not too far from your mind. Is that fair? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And one of the great pleasures for me in getting to write this book was uh, I got to write about something which in this case I sort of unfortunately do know a lot about because I live here in Wisconsin, which has some of the most gerrymandered uh, state legislative districts in the country. And this is a subject which is pretty complicated and i've written about it you know in many magazines and there you get a thousand words at a time maybe if you get a whole feature maybe you can get three thousand words but the story is just there's too much in it to really do it in that amount of space so one thing i was really happy to be able to do in this book is to really stretch out and really write down what i think is the whole story of gerrymandering where it comes from how it Mm. works what are the mathematical strategies for combating it um what was going on in this like supreme court case with this kind of like in what you know for a mathematician is like you know the biggest dud among oral arguments that you will ever see um and and that's something i mean this is why books are good right there's certain things that just it's not a magazine sized story it's a story you need to kind of stretch out and follow all the tendrils and sort of see where they lead so i'm i'm interested in your thoughts on this because i i've i've read i although i haven't read this book i've read a lot of your stuff on gerrymandering and math um and i also have read the supreme court's decision um, and it seems like really ships passing in the night in Absolutely. the sense that uh, here's John Roberts saying this is a political question. And that's a for those of you who are not constitutional lawyers, that's a term of art. It means it's a, a matter that is uh, not appropriate for judicial resolution because to some degree or another it is granted the authority to decide it is granted to some other actor and jordan ellenberg is sitting there saying uh uh there are act there is actually a mathematical way to think about this that gives you an answer to the question of what counts as a legitimate district um and so when you see a supreme court decision like that do you think of it as just a, well, they're speaking a different language than I am, they're, they're solving a different problem than I'm solving? Or do you look at that and say the Supreme Court are a bunch of ge- geometric illiterates and they may think they're speaking a different language, but they're actually just speaking the same language wrongly? Well, I, I, here's what I think, and I try hard in the book not to weigh in on 
the legal merits of the case because I'm not a constitutional lawyer. I don't want to pretend to be one in print or anywhere else. So there's like a, a legal world of like what is appropriate as a matter of constitutional judgment. But I do think it's true that the majority in that case didn't grasp the facts of the case. That's certainly true. Um, and I don't know how much do that, that matters. Do you think it happens in the Supreme matter. Court sometimes? <laughs> I mean, I'm not, but, no, what, I'm being what, a little sarcastic. Are, I just think the, that that happens like fairly often. We were talking about this yesterday. So what are the key facts that the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Roberts, smart guy, what did, what is the fact or the set of facts that he didn't get that if he had gotten, he wouldn't have been able to write the opinion that he wrote? Well, I think that this, many people on the court clearly felt that the issue at hand was one of what's called proportional representation, which is the principle that um, if, a, if one party gets a certain percentage of the vote in a state, then they should get that proportion of the seats in the legislature. And that maybe some deviation from that, of course, is allowed, but that that's the, the goal. That's sort of like the measure of fairness. Um, and that's just factually wrong. That's not the measure of fairness. It, a, it would be a bad measure of fairness, at least under our geographic district system. In other countries, it may be the rule, but not ours. Um, so, and B, it's also not what the plaintiffs were asking for in that case. So somehow the whole, the case turned on the Supreme Court saying, we're not going to give you this thing that you didn't ask for. And actually in the oral argument, it's very visible because the justices are sort of almost pestering the lawyer is sort of saying, like, but don't you really mean, like, are you really asking for proportional representation? Like, no, I'm asking for this other thing. But when you say that, I know you don't want to say proportional representation, but isn't that what you're really asking for? And it is very much like ships passing in the night. Um, and only, you know, only Elena Kagan seems to grasp, like, what the factual question in the case actually is. And how would you describe the factual question in the case? Well, so the point, the point, and this is what sort of takes some length to do in the book, is that the question of what counts as fair is actually really complicated. So you may say that if, if I'm sitting here with a PhD in math saying it's complicated, you may say, okay, then it shouldn't be justiciable. And that's a legal question I'm not going to weigh in on. But I'm going to tell you that proportional representation is certainly not the right answer. I mean, like, look, Massachusetts has 30% Republicans. It has been a long time since there was a 30 percent Republican congressional delegation from Massachusetts. I think for 20 years, every single congressperson from Massachusetts has been a Democrat. And that's not because Massachusetts is, dem is gerrymandered. It's because there just really aren't Republican parts of Massachusetts. So proportional representation is not uh, the right criterion. What we think is the right criterion is something like how similar does the legislature look to a legislature that would have been produced by an impartial actor. Now that's a counterfactual, and I know counterfactuals make people very, very touchy, um, but there are actually like good, solid, robust way, mathematical ways to make good guesses, to assess like what would have happened if this map hadn't been like so grievously, grievously cooked. But the other thing that's important then is that when you say like figuring out what's a fair strict map, is not, first of all, it's not a fully mathematical question, right? It's wound up with all kinds of other things, which is part of what makes it so interesting. Um, but you can't take the math out of it. Um, and that question is probably too hard. It turns out to be much easier to say, what's an unfair district thing? The real goal is to remove the worst of the worst, not to pick the very best one that's perfect. There's no such thing. On that, we could never agree. Um, but removing the worst offenders is extremely possible, and that's what the Supreme Court decided it could not do, and I think it really could have. I mean, it's it's honestly, I feel this is, I, I, I had sort of a sympathy for the devil moment, just like reading some of these, like, you know, released memos from the depositions where um, the person who's drawing the map for the Republicans in the Wisconsin Assembly says to his fellow map makers, you know, we have, we have an opportunity like we've never had before. This is in 2011 after the last census. We may never have an opportunity like this again. And it's our obligation to take advantage of it as much as we can. So in some sense, we've like left the candy like right by the door of the store in a giant open jar, right? We've sort of made it, we've made the benefits of engaging in this dirty practice so, so great and refused to limit it even the tiniest amount that somebody whose job is being a party operative 
I mean, I have a little sympathy that they're like, this is like literally my job to like max out the scale for my party. And they're letting me do it to such an extent. Like, how can I not? It would be, I would be like failing my, what is it called? Like a fiduciary responsibility if I didn't like gerrymander there's no the fiduciary, crap out of the There's no fiduciary responsibility for like immoral behavior, but like I would say <laughs> okay. that, like, like, uh, that would be kind of my counter to that. But like, I see what you're saying, like that, that they've left this lever on the table. So like I have right. to put it. If right. we just made it a little harder, we can't eliminate gerrymandering. That would be impossible, both mathematically, and it would not even really be desirable politically. But we could make it not as profitable. And if we did that, if the incentives were not so incredibly great, I think you would see like a lot more compromise and a lot more political space for reform because nobody likes this. Voters don't like it. I'm not even convinced that the elected officials like it, but they literally feel like they have to do it because they feel like the other side is it will do it if they get the chance. And they feel like the, the, the benefit to them is just like so big that they're like, how can we not? That's what I think it would be great to be able to take away. And the Supreme Court has chosen not to do it. Other state courts have chosen to do it. Stephen, the floor is yours. How do you pronounce your last name, by the way? Uh, Buonapane. Uh, yes. Buonapane. Jordan has it correct, including the meaning. <laughs> um, so I really enjoyed your last book, Jordan, and looking forward to the next oh, one uh, next week, hopefully. Um, so in academia, especially in science, uh, math, and engineering fields, Credit is mostly given for publications in really hyper-specialized forums which discourages faculty from engaging in broader public discourse. So can you tell us more about your own decision to write books for a general audience? And how can academia encourage more early and mid-career faculty to pursue writing for a general audience? And I'm also really curious to hear Kate's uh, perspective on this from, uh, from the legal side. And one of the things I really value so much about this show is the ability to understand fairly complicated legal um, ideas in, in general terms. Well, this before, Jordan all answers all... This oh. before Jordan answers this question, I just wanna say that there is somebody who uh, gets to take full credit for all of his public uh, work, and that is me, uh, <laughs> because many years ago, um, I'm sort of joking, um, many years ago, I got a call from Jack Schaefer, who was then the editor of Slate. And Jack said, I need a guy, a woman, who can write about math in a serious way, but that other people can understand. Because I have this column I want to run on Slate called The Math Guy. And I said, I know exactly who you need to talk to. I put him in touch with Jordan. And that was uh, when Jordan started writing uh, for the public. Although we changed the name because I said to Jack, I was like, why should it, why does it have to be a guy? Like, I happen yeah. to be a guy, but can't we call it something I'm else? Just, That's what the column just, is actually called I'm, You the Math. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm, that was not the name of the column. It was what Jack wanted the column. To I'm be just taking credit for my great, part. I was the one great, who... That's a great move, Jordan. Thank you for doing that. And I, as a person who collectively refers to everyone as guys, but like, <laughs> <Yeah>. still. <laughs> well, the, the Math Guys podcast would be maybe a different question that could be yeah. just... <laughs> but, yeah. but to, um, to Mr. Goodbread's question, sorry, I forgot his first name. Um, Buena Ponte. Steven. Buena yes. Ponte. Steven, Steven, okay. The um, you know, the, the first answer to that question is: if any academics are listening, you should all come teach at the University of Wisconsin Madison, which is an extremely enlightened institution, and where I have gotten nothing but enthusiastic support uh, for this project. In fact, I just not to brag, but I got an extremely nice email from the chancellor of the whole university today, who like saw the review in the New York Times. So they not only don't mind it, they like actively like it. Um, if you, great, uh, you know, we if you get a great review. Yeah, he would have said yeah. you were really bad and mean. <laughs> Kate, <laughs> Kate, G. Sorry, since we're oh. on this subject of she, oh, making assumptions about gender. You're right. Okay. Thank Becky, you. Becky Blank, our awesome chancellor. Okay. Um, but, you know, and we have a thing here called the Wisconsin Idea, which I used to think when I first came was a marketing slogan, but it is actually a real thing. The mission of the university and this the Wisconsin idea says the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. Well, nowadays we interpret it even a little bit more broadly than that. But the fundamental idea is that we are not just here to teach calculus to the 18 to 22 year olds who happen to be here on our campus, that our mission is a lot broader than that. And I've come to see that that is actually a fundamental value of the university. Now, this is not all just going to be about like 
marketing for the University of Wisconsin. I actually think that that attitude is pretty common, that the sort of skill of sort of taking this like specialized knowledge that we've sort of spent many years, like learning how to painfully scratch out of the rock, um, the skill of sort of taking that and sort of talking to the public about it is something that has to be developed and takes a lot of time. And my experience in the math community, not just in Wisconsin, but generally is people are happy that I'm doing it because everybody gets that it needs to be done. And most people don't want to do it themselves, right? Because it's like pretty hard and it takes a lot of specialized training. And so I think in my experience in academia has been because I now I know a lot of people who are professors and who write for the public is that in general, it's like very well thought of. People don't think you're less serious. Um. I don't have that exact same experience yet. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> like, uh, and I don't know how much I can talk about this as like a pre-tenured kind of like, but I would say that like- And I didn't do are, a pre-tenure, by the way. Let's, let's you know, yeah, so be straight about like, that. So there's also that. And then like, I'll just like, I, I will I will leave that where it is. But, the, but okay. the, 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 the general idea is that like, I would say that overwhelmingly people are really supportive of my work at St. John's and they were, very supportive at Yale and very supportive in general. And I have a number of people like in the academy and the legal academy, but the legal academy is very different and really kind of like, when I say different, it just really is it. It is like this weird mix of like half of the schools are professional schools that are almost like mills for creating lawyers and like in certain capacity. And then the other schools are like really about, and like you're supposed to also be a scholar on top of trying to train people to be practitioners. Um, <clears throat> and those things don't necessarily overlap, nor are they expected to. You're just supposed expected to do both. And then there's also like the top, top schools where it's like unclear what you're going to be able to do, but everyone is kind of like assumed to be so smart or so bright that they're going to be able to do both seamlessly. Um, I would just say that like, it just depends. So right now, us uh, well scott knows that like i'm planning on writing a book proposal and like for a trade press and um i'm very excited about it i think it's going to be a great idea but i also it's not going to count towards my tenure file um and uh i have to i have to i'm going to spin half of the book into a law review article also that's going to be like kind of a very kind of more like a different tone kind of very similar how i did like a new yorker piece out of the you know, law review, like late, yeah, law journal piece. Um, but like, I don't know, it's just a very, it's like, it's, I'm very daunted by the task of writing a book. I find, I know that I've written law review articles that are as long as books, but like, it still feels very, very, very different to me uh, for whatever reason. And I just kind of think that a book holds together uh, and looks like honestly, like the binding, the creation of the book, like this type, the setting, the footnotes versus endnotes, or no notes, or like no footnotes or endnotes at all, or like all of those things change the tone so much of like who you're speaking to and what you, the work you expect your reader to do. And like, I just, I have to kind of think about that in a lot of like different ways. So, but I'm looking forward to it. I mean, that's like the fun part of being a scholar is like, this is a fun problem to have for me, not like a heart bad one, if that makes sense. The trick to writing books is not writing books. You write little things. Is that things. a koan? Was that? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm totally serious about it. If you say this is why the dissertation is such a terrible idea as a as a uh, instrument, you know, you if you walk up to somebody and say. Now you're going to write a book, a book length piece of work with original research. They're like, that's really daunting. But if they write an article and then they write another article and then they write on three other things and then a year later they come back and write another article and all of a sudden kind of crystallizes that there's a thematic relationship between these four or five things that they wrote over two years and they bring some ideas together and then all of a sudden you've written a book. You know, well, that's very much that's very in academia. That's very much what the math PhD thesis has become for a lot of people. So I think it's nowadays it's quite common that basically your thesis is like, OK, those three preprints you wrote, like staple them together and sort of write an introduction that makes it seem like in some sense they have sort of something intellectually. I mean, that's, that's, that's what my PhD thesis. was. As I think knows. that's so yeah. much better. It was I really mean, great. It, so it was wonderful. Yeah. Mateo. I think academia often looks a lot more inflexible from the outside than it is from the inside. We're actually like we sort of try to do things that intellectually make sense. 
and be yeah, no, no. I, my point is not less a criticism of academia than it is a, a you know, a, like people are always wonder, feel daunted by the idea of writing books, and that's mm. often because they start out from a dead stop rather than you know start out having written. 60,000 words between a bunch of different places over a long period of time right. on a thematically related subject. Which is already a book in a big enough font. Yeah, exactly. Mateo, this time for real, the floor is yours. Great, thanks. Um, well, I have a few questions. I don't really know which one to ask. Uh, well, actually, the first one is kind of a, a moot point because I just flipped through... Um, the uh, bullet-riddled airplane is like a thing, way, way, way predating the current meme. Just so you know. Yeah, no, I mean, I remembered it. I always attributed it to um, to Jordan's book uh, because yeah. I read it seven years ago, and I remember he tells that story. But the picture is not in my book. Yeah. That amazing picture somebody I else made in a completely different context. And I just yeah. found out that that was not you. So apologies on on that one. Um, but oh, the other ones. Oh, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on the structure or the shape of law. Uh, the reason I ask is because I was actually doing some reading inspired by uh, Scott's jurisprudence course podcast, and it was built off of the theory of planning that has all this embedding into it. And I was thinking that sounds a whole lot like fractals and self-similarity across scale, things like that. And in fact, work has actually been written about the law as a fractal, as a category with a sort of fractal fuzzy boundary. And I'm curious if either of you have any thoughts on that. Great question. I love that question for like a million reasons, yeah. but they're cognitive science reasons. They might be neural net reasons, but. I mean, one thing about fractals is that I would say this, the notion of self-similarity and the note and the notion of having this kind of like infinitely wiggly and weird boundary are both properties of frequently encountered fractals, but they're not the same property. They're two different facts about fractals. So one question is like, I, I think it's, I mean, I mean, if you want a serious answer to the question, it's clear that like law features boundaries that are not kind of like well met metaphorized by like nice, sharp, straight lines. Um, and the question is whether the better metaphor is something like a fractal, which has like a very deterministic, well-defined boundary, but that's like extremely, extremely complicated. So complicated that you can't really like specify it in uh, in a finite way only by some kind of like recursive iterative way or whether it's something like what you might call a gradient where the boundary is it might sort of be shaped like a straight line but it's fuzzy and you don't go from one to zero you go from sort of like legal to almost legal to sort of legal to kind of legal to not very legal to illegal and there's just this there's a sort of continuous shading with no sharp boundaries at all those are two different ways a boundary can be more complicated than a sharp straight line they're both geometric notions and i you guys will know much better than me if either of those is a good metaphor for the law or if one is better than the other so zach bliss brought up in the comments Jeremy Sheff, who has been on the show and is my colleague at St. John's, his incredible paper, Legal Sets, that he published a number of oh, years wow. ago in 2016. You should really look at this. I put it in the, uh, I'll send it to you separately. Have you ever seen it, Scott? No, I, I've never seen that. Um, can, 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 actually, can I, can I say just one thing about the geometry of law? I think in some sense that I mean, I had never thought about it geometrically, so that's such a, it's a nice, it's a really great question. And also like just the, just the occasion of your book makes me think, okay, what can I think about geometrically? But I feel like there's two different pictures about the law um, in jurisprudence. One is like a kind of a hierarchical kind of set of um, kind of decision trees or something where you have the constitution at the top and then you have federal laws and treaties and then you have state laws and things and you have maybe administrative um, regulations coming out from the size but then you have this other picture okay of rather than having a top-down thing but like a web okay where nothing where there's things that are towards the center but nothing's like directly in the center and everything is exerting some degree of force um, 
uh, around it. And I think one of the, in this um, more of a kind of heart, uh, a, a, a kind of HLA heart picture, which is a kind of a top down. And then another one is like a Dworkin picture where it's like a web and, and, and every law is exerting kind of a normative influence on everything else, much like gravity. Um, and actually, you know, there's a notion, there's so many different geometries. And one of the ones I write about in the book is an interesting class of geometries where every single point inside a circle is its center. Like, it's not that no point is a center, it's that every point is central to the circle. That's a little weird to get your head around, but... No, wait, is yeah. that because of dimensions? Or because, is that true in, is that true in a circle, thinking of a circle as a two-dimensional space? No, it's usually kinds of geometry that aren't well modeled by dimension at all. Like it's sort of the okay. geometry of the family, like your notion of like how like it's the it's the geometry where your nth cousin is a distance n from you. It's like that geometry. How how close are you to your cousin? Type of yeah, thing. exactly. Like why you're your own negative first cousin. For that instance. makes that's sense. One of the chap that's one of the chapter titles. So I write about that geometry. That's Alice cool. Lee, you get the last question today, and okay. it was a struggle to bring you on screen because we yeah, talked too much. No, it's because my something went wrong. Um, oh. I was wondering if you think the so it seems if you think the demand for I don't want to call it like pop mathematics, but uh, general audience please mathematics. Do. I wanted to be popular, so okay. please do. <laughs> Best selling math. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you think that that's constant over time, or does it like does something like gerrymandering kind of bring it to the public interest, or yeah? Yeah, it's a great question. And I remember in the 90s when I was in graduate school, this speaks to actually Kate's experience. Like there was a huge wave of publicity around the proof of Fermat's last theorem. And there was like a bunch of really successful or popular math books. And in that moment, I was like, crap, this is when it's happening. This is when you can actually write about this stuff in public. And I'm missing it because I'm a grad student. I really, when you're a grad student, you really can't take time off to do it. Um, but it turned out that that has been like a very consistent level of interest. And I talked to like a, a wonderful bookseller I know. He, he said, yeah, he said that is like a consistent market. Like people really want books about mathematics. People actually want to learn. I didn't, I hadn't known this. He, and he's, he made a funny thing with his hand. He was like, it's kind of like this. It's like always there. It's just kind of consistent. Now it's not like Hitler and Lincoln are here. <laughs> they're like, they're constantly like, so it's not up here with Lincoln and, and Hitler, but like math is like here, you know, it's not like this. It's like, <laughs> What, 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 I put what, Lincoln your... in the new book so I could go up to this. You know, that was my goal by putting a little bit of Lincoln in it. There's no Hitler, but there's some Lincoln. Was there was there a work of popular mathematics that got you interested in mathematics? Oh, I would say that the book Gertel Escher Bach. I don't know if people know oh, that I, book. Anymore, as a matter of fact, yeah, look, I'm actually Oh my God, visual aid. I, I'm literally reading it right now only what? because. What? We did not plan this. So, no, it's, no, so but, cute. I, I, it's so cute. <laughs> Uh, and we didn't, we actually people, did not plan it, but that's a great book. Wait, mm -hmm. for the member of the Greek chorus to whom I suggested uh, uh, that you listen to Bach's musical offering you know, on a car ride uh, uh, so, the yeah, other day, right. uh, if you want a great, uh, amusing and fun and playful discussion of the musical offering and its mathematical content and its recursive content. Uh, Gertel Escher Bach is, uh, it is, well, it's the Bach part of Gertel Escher and Bach. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's, a, it's probably 200 pages of the book. Yeah, yeah, and that, it, and that it, book, you know, it's called Girdle Escherbach and Eternal Golden Braid. That's the full title, and it so captures the way what he does. That's so wonderful. Is first of all, there's incredibly deep mathematics in it, but it's also stories, right? It's also like very, uh, yeah. very readable, and th there are moments where it gets very granular, and it's actually like hard, and you might want to take out your pencil, but you're very quickly back to the story, and it just sort of insists that math is not a separate realm of human activity. It's wound up with all the other things we do with our bodies and our minds, like like music and drawing and painting in, in the case of that book. Um, and so it's always been a model for me. I mean, I read it many, many times when I was a kid, and it sort of still has stuff to deliver. Well, yeah, as, well as, I, you're, I, I, as you're finding, I hope, Scott. Yeah, no, I, I was, I was, um, uh, I, I, I myself actually um, am pretty, I, I know computability theory pretty well, except that I'm reading the book just because I think it's just, a, I'm just, a, I think it's just a model of clarity and how to, how to relate very difficult ideas to um, uh, generally interested people that um, I'm so happy that you 
you also, um, I, I, I should say, I'm happy that I also like it. <laughs> Scott I think like my tuna melt dialogue of the Supreme Court is like based on the talking animal dialogues in Gertel Escherbach. It's kind of like my homage. The, the, the tuna melt dialogue is my homage to the talking animals that talk to each I other. Want, I wanted to give, so this is, um, this is a first edition of the hedgehog and the fox that is like, wow. that I got as a present to myself um, last year. Um, and I was actually, I'm, I was going, as you were giving your talk about your UW, like love of UW, I was thinking they should add the badger. UW uh, is in Seattle, we're UW. Oh, sorry, UW. Oh, sorry. There, oh really? Is that oh, yeah. a difference? Oh, it's a difference. Wait, this is like how I had to learn about Michigan when my brother went to Michigan, that like Michigan State and Michigan are not called Michigan. They're both, like they're not. Oh my God, things. you coasties. I mean, okay. <laughs> we have got that, to wrap. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Jordan Allenberg, you're a great American. The book is. Wait, 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 wait. Let me, Let's all let me do it. Big. Yeah. I'll, oh, I'll uh, show the oh, British one on. too with the Dorito. Look, I have both. Yeah. Why? There we go. Shape. You should order it. You should read it. Uh, and after we've all read it, we'll have Jordan back to field questions about it. Yeah. Awesome. That office hours. Great. Yeah, exactly. It'll be office <laughs> hours on shape. The the magazine is shape. The column is the math girl. <laughs> um, uh, uh, go out, subscribe to shape uh, and, and get in. You're the get in worst human then. Like there's someone <laughs> clipping this and spreading I'm, misinformation all I'm over the, the second internet. Worst. Um, it's called Synergy, Kate. Look it up. That's right. <laughs> look, I mean, if you Google shape, if a whole lot of people Google shape trying to get to the magazine, a certain number of them are going to uh, get to Jordan's book instead. And their lives will be forever changed. <laughs> <laughs> we will be back tomorrow, people. Who's our guest tomorrow? Oh, God, I hope we know. Um, oh, yes, it's Anna. So we're fine. We're Anna. And I've got, I will launch. Anna show it. who? Anna Brasic. Sorry, she's going to be speaking about her um, her uh, her new book that is coming out of her dissertation. She is a professor, I think, at Michigan State. It might be Michigan, Western Michigan. But I have to check. So. And we should tell That'll people, be Ben, that in case you didn't know, even though the book is not coming out till next Tuesday, you can order it now. And actually, you should, because all pre-ordered books are counted in first in the week first sales. Week, so yeah. authors love it. Authors love it if you pre-order. So you do not have to wait if you've already so we made up have, your mind. We, we have shared the book in the uh, repeatedly over the, in, in the chat. Order it now. We will be back 22 hours and 57 minutes from now. You see, that was math. I did subtraction, uh, which is not geometric. Um, or hidden uh, anymore. Okay. <laughs> but uh, until then, Scott? We can't have fun anymore, but we can actually measure the distance between where we are and where fun is. That's Love it. Um, and, and, then, and, then, and then plot it. So um, it's not so bad. Um, we'll see you tomorrow.